two, one. Good evening, everyone. How are you? My name is Andre Ng. I am owner and president of House and Eyes, and I'm delighted to have a guest with me today, Mary Schwartz from Growing Chefs. Mary, how are you doing tonight? Awesome. Yeah, super good. How are you? Good, good. We had a few uh, technical glitches, but nothing we couldn't overcome, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we're rolling. Right. So uh, thanks for you who have joined in tonight. Uh, tonight is about uh, education. Uh, you know, our vision statement at House of Knives is to improve the lives of those around us through education, innovation. And we started partnering with Growing Chefs almost uh, just over a year ago, I guess it was, Mary. And um, we, uh, my roots were in Vancouver Island, and I just so happened to be at Camosun College working with uh, Chef uh, Steve Duncan Walker. And uh, he was telling me about what a great organization. He's like, have you heard of Growing Chefs? Because if you guys are into doing education, teaching people about the proper use of tools, et cetera, you should really talk to the growing chefs. I'm like, well, what are they all about? And uh, so he made the connection and we connected with you. And uh, yeah, the rest is history because uh, the alignment, uh, I would say, is, is so similar. Wouldn't you uh, agree, Mary? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know, for example, that House of Knives donated literally hundreds of knives to the classroom gardening program which allows chefs to get into schools and teach kids how to grow and cook their own food and you know that's they're literally providing the tools for the program to work yeah one of, one of our philosophies is always about uh empowering people with the knowledge right and i think uh, very similar philosophy as you have when it comes to food because what i love what you do with the kids that range anywhere from five years old to 12 years old is basically empower them with the knowledge of not just how to cook, but understanding where food comes from, how it's grown. It just doesn't show up at the grocery store, correct? Oh, absolutely. And the word you used just now, empowered, is the perfect word. There's nothing more empowering than planting a seed and nurturing it and watching it grow and then eating it. I mean, it gives kids this feeling, you know, a valuable and legitimate feeling that they can take care of themselves. They can change their landscape. They can feed themselves. There's just nothing more powerful. Yeah, and you know, having the right tools, it's funny, I just had the conversation with a friend yesterday and I said to her, I said, do you like cooking? She says, not really. And I said, do you have good knives in your kitchen? She goes, not really. I said, well, there's a direct correlation, right? Because it's like anything you do, whether you're a carpenter or you're you know, a gourmet chef in the kitchen, if you don't have the right tools to work with, you don't feel inspired to use them, you don't feel inspired to create, right? And you know, having that knowledge is, is definitely the key. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even if you're not an expert chef, I'm sure everybody's had the experience of like showing up in a vacation rental or something, you've got all your groceries, you're super excited to make beautiful food on your vacation and there's nothing in the cupboards. You don't have the tools you need to prepare the meals you planned for and not having the right tools and the right knowledge to you know, create beautiful meals is a huge barrier. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's that knowledge. So tonight you're gonna to walk through a nice basic recipe that uh, parents can do with their kids. Uh, what age range would you say uh, for most of the recipes that you offer are ideally suited for Mary? Well, we offer two programs. One is the two classroom gardening programs, I should say. One is a primary program aimed at kids grades one through three, so give or take around six to eight. Um, and then an intermediate program, which runs for grades five, six, seven, so give or take again, that sort of like nine, 10 to 12 year old range. Yeah. Um, all of the recipes in the program are accessible to kids of any age. The recipe that we're gonna do tonight is in our intermediate program because not only do we use it to teach cooking skills, but we actually have the kids write their own recipes and learn how recipes work using this particular template because it's very flexible. So that's yeah. something we use for slightly older kids, but definitely kids of any age could achieve this recipe. It's straightforward, it's flexible, it's fun, it's easy, it's interesting and it's delicious. So yeah. there's that. That's great. So Mary, I, I know it's funny because we kind of went down this path, you know, for decades. We've been almost like knife nerds, I guess you would say, in terms of we go to the factories every other year in Germany still, and we learn how the knives are made, where they're made, what the materials made out of. But we started shifting a few years back, uh, not just knowing about the product, but more so focusing on teaching people how to use the product, because so many people have obviously everyone should have a good knife in their kitchen to cook with and, and feed themselves and their families but it's uh, amazing how many people don't know how to use them so when you suggest getting kids involved in the cooking process with their families making meals 
what 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 is the biggest obstacle that that you think uh, kids face is it uh, you know parents intimidated or or scared to have their kids get involved yeah i think you nailed it I, one of the biggest things is is fear and like you said sometimes that stems from maybe the adult in the family not having the skills or not knowing how to use their tools and not being able to pass that knowledge to their kids for how to you know for how their kids can keep themselves safe so in the program we always work with the comfort level of the kids and the teacher, and of course the chef volunteers and other volunteers who are in the classroom. We don't um, demand that anybody use knives or tools they're not comfortable with. And there's so many there's so many steps you can do before you start using knives. You can have your kids in the kitchen tearing spinach leaves, you know, washing mm -hmm. vegetables, breaking things into pieces, doing the preparation work, and passing them off to an adult who's going to do the knife work. And then slowly, as the kids and the parents become more comfortable you can start passing on those knife skills to kids. Um, of course, we have chefs in the classroom, so we're always teaching kids the claw, you know, to keep your yeah. fingers straight up and down to avoid cutting them. And yeah. any anything like that, anything that the kids can grab onto and relate to and also have fun with is an immediate um, learning tool. So they get it, they see it working, they feel safe and comfortable. And I would say, with very few exceptions, by the end of our classroom gardening and cooking program, almost all the kids feel comfortable using knives because they have been taught properly. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. I was I was so thrilled. I, I got a chance to go with Jadine to one of the yeah. elementary schools and watch the program. And you know, when we do knife sessions for whether it be adults or kids, it's amazing. Like you said, how many adults aren't even familiar with what the claw is and, and how to hold the knife properly. And the one session when I was at the classroom, they had on the big slides were talking about how to grip the knife properly, and it just warmed my heart <laughs> to see <laughs> little kids learning. I was like, wow, that, that's uh, so inspiring, right? And and it is inspiring to see that excitement and enthusiasm they have. Yeah, and pride. You know, it's a skill that all the kids might think that they can't achieve or that is only for adults. But when they learn that they can do it, it's the same thing we were talking about earlier. There's that empowerment. There's that desire to be involved in preparing food, be right there with their older family members in the kitchen. Um, and of course, one thing I should mention, as I'm sure you do in your training programs, that we don't allow kids to use knives without supervision. There's always someone supervising. But once the kids have it mastered, that person can be there to be more of a backup than having to do everything for them. Yeah, absolutely. Mary, I'm just going to uh, show the viewers quickly some of the recommendations. So we get asked a lot in store and I'll find terms of, you know, how to get kids started and what do they suggest for knives. So maybe I'll run through that quickly, then we can get right That's into great. the recipe after that. Yeah, totally. Great. Okay. So safety being paramount. So I'm just going to move the camera down to the board here and show everyone what we're looking at. So it's funny, we did a, a great episode on global TV a number of years ago and the whole segment was talking about how to empower your kids and when do they start cooking or helping cook in the kitchen and, and what tools to use. So one of the things, so these are those uh, paring knives you talked about. We, I think we donated about 500 of them to and, and maybe yeah. because of the pandemic, you didn't get a chance to use them all yet, but these not ones yet. are great. You did get a chance to use some of them? Well, not yet. But oh, not yet. Okay. But they will be used. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, even something like this is great. And it's funny because a lot of people, you can go on the internet and a lot of people are selling uh, plastic knives or serrated plastic knives for kids to use. And that's not, um, you know, I used a word and you talked about it earlier about empowerment. It, it's kind of a false sense of security for the kids, right? You need to teach them that responsibility. And they, it's amazing how much they respect it once they get working with it. So I know you guys, uh, you know, start off the kids with this four inch paring knife, which is okay, it, it's better than nothing. One of the things that we started carrying is a kid size cut resistant glove like I have here. We used to carry these only adult sizes, but these are great regardless of how big or small a knife is. You know, you're not gonna injure yourself. So even for adults, we, you know, we, we sell a lot of these just because if people, as you said, aren't taught properly from a young age, even as adults, they never learn it properly. So. The, uh, I'll take the glove off just to show you what you talked about. So the claw is very important and the most basic and fundamental uh, method of holding a knife and using it is what I call the rock chop. So learn, I, I know how you guys show it is kind of the claw and saw technique. Is that correct? I hear you talk That's about right. that where the kids are working with a knife like that. So the only downfall of using a narrow blade like this and I kind of brought these two knives to kind of illustrate. So both these knives I have on the board here are six inches in length. 
But one big difference is one is much wider in, in width versus this one. When you use a narrow blade on a cutting board, the downfall you have with it is what, not all of the blade really makes contact with the cutting board. You see a bit of a gap here underneath here because my knuckles actually hit on the cutting board. As you graduate and get more comfortable with the knife, then go with something with a wider blade like this six inch chef's knife where there's no light gap coming in underneath here. Then you can work directly on the cutting board more effectively and efficiently. And that's where, you know, when you're working uh, with a chef's knife, the main thing you want to focus on where the knife should make contact is that kind of middle finger here. And that acts as the guide as you work with it. And the most basic fundamental way to teach kids to use a knife in the safest way we suggest is the rock chop where the blade never leaves the cutting board for contact. So they should never be just cutting away wildly like this. But if they pivot that tip of the blade and they make the claw and you always tuck your fingers in and your thumb behind, then you're just working along like this. It's like a, you know, a choo-choo train effect where you're just moving your finger along with the blade and it acts as a guide. So when you're doing your cutting, right, it doesn't have to be fast, but you know, obviously as you get more proficient and accustomed to it, then it becomes easier. So it's generally the smaller blades uh, for kids um, that we recommend something like this in a six inch size. And then ultimately, most adults will get into more of a, what we call an eight inch chef's knife size. This is a much larger blade, uh, longer and wider. But I'm just gonna show you quickly, I, I don't know if I mentioned to, I mentioned JD, we've been actually working on a kids only knife. We've been developing now for almost a year. So what we wanted to design was something that's uh, uber safe for the kids. So this knife here was the first prototype, if you will, that we, we kind of uh, passed around. I didn't get it, I meant to give it to Jadine and have you take it around to some of the kids and use the program, but it's a five inch blade, rounded tip, so there's no chance of harming themselves. But the feedback we got from this, unfortunately, was there's almost too much curvature in the blade. You'll see not a lot of the blade makes contact with the board. So the next uh, Evolution 2.0 is this one. So this is uh, not a ceramic knife, it's not a white knife, but this is a 3D printed knife made from plastic. The factory made this for us. And so as you can see here, it's a very flat curvature on the board. It's almost 100% flat on the board. It's got a great curvature here. So, you know, it's very safe and it's just gonna be the perfect size. So this is gonna be coming out this fall. And it's, uh, yeah, we've been working on this for about uh, over a year now because we saw a need of people who wanted something a little bit, uh, you know, um, an upgrade for their kids. And this one's got a very unique, uh, what they call choil here. So it's indented. So even when they're properly holding that knife, it keeps a little bit safer so their fingers can't slip down onto the blade. So we're pretty excited about this one. It's gonna be a, a fun little knife. And it's it's something that's suitable even, not just for kids, but even adults that aren't comfortable using knives. So yeah, by, by this fall, we, we hope to have this in our stores. That is so cool. I'm yeah. so excited about that. Yeah, what, you'll be one of the first to get it. I mean, I can. I already uh, mentioned JD. I can see us, you know, having the Grown Chefs logo on there, and it, it'd be such a fun thing, right? Oh my because god! And it's so exciting for kids to be able to use a knife that feels like a real knife, a real chef's knife. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the other great thing is too. What I always tell parents, you know, the great thing is when you're working with your kids in the kitchen, it can be a, somewhat of a family event, right? We live in a, a day and age where kids only worry about how much screen time they have, and they don't have much time uh, as a family. So, you know, to collectively make a meal together, give them that understanding, and you know, start that healthy eating and lifestyle as early as possible, right? Oh, absolutely. And what we see every day in the program is kids taking that information that they're so excited about home to their families and they're educating their families and they're getting their families excited about cooking, trying new foods. And when it's the kids bringing that innovation into the household, it's just incredible. It's so beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Even a simple thing as a potato peeler, a lot of kids at a young age have never used them before. Again, parents are, you know, maybe a little bit cautious or, uh, or intimidated by giving them something sharp, but, you know, get them involved. Use, uh, use a, a peeler just to peel a potato or, you know, another great item that we sell are these uh, spiralizers, right? You have to make food fun for kids, right? So even to take, you know, a regular carrot and show them how to peel it, they think is a lot of fun, right? Kids are are easily uh, bored, I guess, if you will. So even something as simple as spiralizer, you can just take it, you know, and just create ribbons of food for them, just a snack on even, right? You just have to make it fun for them. 
Yeah. And making food fun is a huge part of it. And that's, that's incredible. That's so yeah. much fun. Yeah, absolutely. So Mary, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Why don't you uh, give us a, a sense of what you're going to be uh, showing us how to make tonight? Absolutely. So in this lesson, we make what we call the six parts of a plant salad. So we're making a salad using every single part of a plant um, from, well, we'll discuss the parts of a plant, but from the bottom yeah. right up to the top. So right off the top of your head, Andre, can you name any parts of the plant? Oh my God. You know, I grew up on a, I'm a, I'm a third generation vegetable farmer and my dad knew very early on that none of us three boys were going to be farmers. So <laughs> considering I'm, I'm, I'm third generation farmer, I should be able to nail this, but I would say seed, right? Yeah. Is that one? <laughs> Absolutely. Seed. So that's starting at the very top. If we want to work our way down from the top mm -hmm. seed and the seed comes from uh, part of the plant that, uh, well, you know, let's look at it like this. We often categorize the difference between fruits and vegetables being that fruits contain the seed, but a lot of plants have a have fruit as well. And it, can, it usually contains the seeds. So we have the seeds, the fruit, before the fruit, the plant will produce a flower. Uh, then we have the leaves, of course, we have the stalk or the stem and we have the roots. So in this salad, what's so fun about it is all you need is one or more of each part of the plant. So for example, I have picked these radishes from my garden just now. Yeah. Beautiful root vegetable, but any vegetable that grows underground, as we know, can be considered a root vegetable. So carrots, beets, um, parsnips, turnips, anything that you like can be your root vegetable. So let's start with the root vegetable. We'll work our way back up from the bottom. So I'm also going to tilt the camera down so we can see oh, so we can see the cutting board. Hmm. I need to move this back a little bit. So one thing I really wanted to mention, because something that we're trying to focus on at Growing Chefs a lot these days is um, eliminating food waste as much as possible. So many people grow radishes or love to get radishes from the grocery store. But since they're one of the easiest things to grow, a lot of people are growing them in their gardens. And we're used to breaking, you know, breaking off the leaves and using the root in our food. But these leaves, especially when they're young like this, are actually super delicious. So what I've been doing is saving all my radish tops and they make a really nice pesto, for example. They have a little bit of like a spiciness. So you could blend them up with some almonds or sunflower seeds, some olive oil, some Parmesan or Pecorino, any other hard, sharp cheese and make a delicious pesto to put on your pasta with something you would normally throw out. So just a little tip as we get going. Yeah. So. In general, Mary, a lot of vegetables, leaves are, are fully edible. I know on, on the farm, one of the crops we grew were beets and people, uh, you know, we, we harvested beets not only in bunches, but also in bulk and the leaves didn't go to waste. People bought them. Oh, yeah. Beet tops are ab absolutely delicious. They're one of my favorite foods, actually. My family has a tradition of eating beet tops at Christmas, if we could get our hands on them. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so after the root will come the stem. Andre, can you think of any stem vegetables that you might be familiar with? This one's a little bit trickier. We don't tend to eat quite as many stems. Stem vegetables, well, broccoli. Uh, I, I, broccoli has a stem, which is- People don't think to cook the stems, but you know, when we talk about, yeah, reducing food waste, uh, the stem is as much nutrition as the flower, but a lot of people unfortunately throw it away. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, broccoli stems are one of my favorite snacks. They're so crunchy and delicious. Uh, another stem vegetable we don't always realize is the stem is celery. When we're eating celery, we're eating the stem of the plant. It has roots mm -hmm. that grow underground and leaves that grow on the top. But that stalk is actually the part that we consider the vegetable. Another stem vegetable or stalk vegetable that's in season right now is asparagus. Yeah, and, love asparagus. Oh, we all oh, love asparagus and it's so wonderful because it's just here for such a short period of time it's like this beautiful fleeting moment of spring um and that's exactly how asparagus grows right up from the ground this is the stalk and or the stem so i actually have some asparagus that i poached earlier to be you know to have ready for this um for this lesson but one thing i did want to mention is that as most people know when you're going to cook your asparagus you would break the, you would just 
feel for where the break is and usually throw this part away. This part's a little bit woody and we don't usually eat this. Yeah. Um, you can save those asparagus ends to make stock with. They make a beautiful like spring consomme or mm. soup. Um, of course, you can feed them to animals like chickens or compost them if that's your best method, but they don't have to be thrown out. And I was going to mention um, with your uh, little, your kid's chef knife, chef's knife, another wonderful thing to do is eat your uh, asparagus raw. Not a lot of people do that, but especially mm. if you just slice it really really into really nice thin slices you have these beautiful little crunchy delicious bits of asparagus mm. so we can set those aside and add them to our salad later as well then of course after the salad or after the um stem comes the leaves and most of us are very familiar with leaf vegetables i'm sure you could name like 25 right off the top of your head um, so for today, I picked, I've got my first leaves coming out of my garden, actually. So I picked some spinach, some arugula, and uh, a little bit of leaf lettuce. So let me ask you a question, being a knife expert, Andre. Yes. What do you feel about the controversial issue of tearing versus cutting your lettuce? Yeah, it's funny. I, I did a bit of research on that because uh, most people would tell you that. Uh, and even when I did my culinary training, it was never cut your lettuce with a knife, right? Always tear it so you don't get as much browning but you know from from what i've read and from my own experience i can't say there's a, a massive difference i would say there's a bigger difference between you know some people love using ceramic knives and part of their uh you know advantages they won't impart any flavors or taste of food and but if you use a high carbon steel knife that can change the uh, i guess the chemistry of the vegetable if you will but if you're talking about a normal good high carbon non stainless steel blade versus tearing. Um, I, I, I can't say there's a, a massive difference uh, from my experience. How, how about yourself, Mary? I, I agree with you. I actually have sort of a um, philosophy where I tear young lettuce. So this let or not just lettuce, but this is kale, but young greens that come right out of the garden that are very tender. Yep. I find benefit from like, they don't bruise quite as much if you treat them very gently and tear them. But yeah. any larger, more established lettuce um, can easily be cut with a knife, especially as you were mentioning, a nice sharp knife, because that's something very important to keep in mind. I'm sure you tell people this all the time, that the sharper your knife, not only the safer it is, but the better it treats your, your vegetables or your other products. Absolutely. One of the tests that we do in our uh, knife session skills is at the BM class, we take an apple and we cut it with a sharp knife one side and then we take the other side and cut it with a serrated knife. And within about half an hour, you can see the difference in terms of the one that's cut with a less sharp knife has more cellular structure damage and it browns more than one that doesn't. And the other fact that a lot of people ask about is, well, how do I cut onions without tearing up? You know, you, um, again, yes. using a sharp knife helps that versus a dull knife. Absolutely, that's a very important trick. Having worked in kitchens for many years, I know when you're standing next to someone who's prepping with a sharp knife compared to a dull knife, you can always tell when they're cutting their onions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so that's the leaves section of our plant. And after the leaves, we get flowers. Now that one's a little bit trickier. Um, can you think of any flowers off the top of your head? There's actually- Cauliflower, a, one of my favorites. Exactly, cauliflower literally has the word flower in it. And as we discussed earlier, uh, Broccoli has the stem, which is, of course, a super delicious part of the plant. But actually, the part that we eat, the broccoli crown, is actually the flower of the plant. So yeah. I did the same thing with this nice young broccoli earlier. I just uh, blanched it to have it ready for the salad. Just poached it in a very shallow um, pot of water and then dumped it right into some ice water to keep it nice and green and crisp. But something I did want to mention is that especially if you have a garden growing, a lot of your plants might start to flower early, more earlier than you expected. For example, I was out today in the garden and I had some pak choy and this um, sorrel plant that had started to bolt or flower. And when your plants start to flower, sometimes that'll make the remainder of the plant start to taste different. It can be a little bit more bitter. But if you pick those flowers off, they are so delicious. They add this little bit of bite often to your food, just a little, they can serve as a beautiful garnish. Yeah. And um, yeah, the flowers of plants are actually absolutely delicious. So we'll throw this on our salad towards the end. And, and I think with kids, when you tell them it's a flower, but it's edible, it really piques their interest too, right? They, they love novelties like that. 
Oh, absolutely. And to go out and find, you know, figure out which plants are flowers, which plants are stems, which plants are stalks. As long as they get the right flowers, right? <laughs> yeah, as long as they get the right flowers. Yeah. Um, and so almost, uh, almost last but not quite least is the fruit. So we talked about how some, um, how some vegetables are the fruits of plants, and that can include some that we're very familiar with, tomatoes, we know are fruit, cucumbers, we know are fruit, and peppers are actually considered a berry, I believe, but okay. technically they are the fruit of the pepper plant. Yeah. Um, so especially since we have some kind of larger pieces in our salad already, our big broccoli and big uh, asparagus, I think I would just cut these peppers into thin slices for a little bit of pop of color. That's quite the chef's knife you have, Mary. It looks like a 12 inch chef's knife, is it? Yes, it's it's a good sturdy, <laughs> uh, it's a good sturdy knife. I, ha I have to admit, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I feel like it's not as sharp as it should be for this, uh, especially talking to you tonight. Um, <laughs> but I'm a pastry chef. So yes. for me, it's more important to have like a big rocker knife because I do so much of what you were talking about, chopping nuts, chopping chocolate. Mm -hmm. I don't do a lot of fine, work with a knife more yeah. you know the, my knives are used for like that sort of heavy duty work so this knife comes in really handy for that wow um so last but not least we talked about the seeds so for seeds we know that um a lot of the vegetables that we eat come in the form of seeds corn is a good example where we're eating the seed of the plant peas yeah. Another example, they're tucked right in the pods. Those we can, you see when you plant pea seeds or bean seeds that they actually are the, literally the seeds. We sprout them and turn them into new vegetables. Um, so for this salad, you could definitely add uh, corn or peas in season. Or another really nice thing to do is just toast some sunflower seeds or mm. uh, pumpkin seeds for a nice crunch. And I did toast some pumpkin seeds, but I actually, unfortunately, we just realized I placed them in a very inaccessible place with my camera set up right now. So we're just gonna have to imagine that for now. I apologize. Okay, we can even see the seeds at the moment, but believe me when I say they're gonna finish the salad off with six parts of the plant. Sure. Hey, Mary, yes. we had someone with a question asking about the woody part of the asparagus. They're wondering, could you just not peel it away? But my experience is it's pretty fibrous all the way through, is it not? Yeah, that fibrous woody part does go through the whole stem. Um, yeah. It's true you can uh, peel asparagus if you have like a older sort of more mature piece of asparagus and you want to get into that more tender interior part. Some people do like to peel the, the skin, um, but that woody part really does need to be removed. It's always an unpleasant surprise when you, you're yeah. doing that crunchy tender beautiful asparagus and you bite into a bunch of fiber it, it's a great jaw workout though isn't it <laughs> yeah that is a great job yeah. um so let's not forget those flowers and one favorite recipe we have in the growing chefs program is our honey vinaigrette that was developed or was shared with us early on i would say we got this recipe going in our program more than 10 years ago by a wonderful chef gabriella meyer become a huge favorite among students, teachers, chef volunteers. And you can find that recipe on our website, various media. And if you want to search for the Growing Chef's Honey Vinaigrette, you will find it. And to save time, I prepared this earlier today. Um, but it's the perfect balance for this like bright spring salad, just a little hint of sweetness. And that is the six parts of a plant salad. And as I was saying earlier, one of the best things about this recipe is that you don't have to have specific ingredients. You can make it with whatever you have on hand. So if you have radishes, great. But if you have carrots in your fridge, that even better. If you have, if it's pea seeds and you've got peas, great. If not, sunflower seeds. So it gives kids, families, teachers so much room for experimentation. You can rewrite this salad every day if you wanted. Yeah. And like I was saying, it's a really nice way to talk about how recipes work when you're choosing the things that are going into your recipe, you know the general structure, then you have to start to think about, okay, if I have this cucumber today for my fruit, what steps do I take to prepare it? Versus if I'm using a uh, squash, for example, what steps would I take to prepare that as the fruit in this recipe? So it's 
it's such a fun activity. Yeah. What, what's great too, Mary, I know you guys talk about it in your program and a lot of nutritionists talk about it is, is basically cook with what's in season, right? Not only is it more affordable, but it's, it's healthy, right? Absolutely. It's more nutritious. As we all know, and something we discuss a lot in the program is the impact that the food we choose has on our community, our planet, our health. Um, so choosing local food when possible and in season food when, when it's possible. Um, yeah just results in better, you know, care for ourselves and everything around us. Yeah. You will just even from an eco-friendly standpoint and carbon footprint, you know, it's not something I was ever cognizant of when growing up on a farm, but, you know, fully understanding of, of how far your food travels to get you. And in today's day and age, we're, we're somewhat spoiled as a society. I mean, I, when I grew up, I remember strawberries were basically only summer, right? You only got them when local strawberries came. But now, of course, you can have strawberries any month of the year because they'll bring them in from wherever they, they can uh, around the world. Yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, it's very true. We have access to food anytime from anywhere. Although I think just about everybody would agree that eating a strawberry in January that's traveled, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, picked when it's not ripe, grown for its um, ability to travel and its resistance, rather than for its flavor and color and um, texture, pales in comparison if you do wait it out and have those amazing strawberries that come around once a year there's just nothing like it yeah um, no absolutely I, I remember when my kids were growing up they used to say are these different varieties strawberries i said no it's because they're local <laughs> that's yeah. how it should taste but unfortunately you know like you said whether it be banana strawberries or anything else from time they pick it when it's you know raw and you know by the time it gets here it, it's totally different uh, flavor yeah Absolutely. And I mean, I'm sure, again, within the context of handling the food, preparing it, using your tools, um, when you're working with fresh produce that you grow yourself, that you get from a neighbor, that you get from a farmer, from your local supermarket, you see those results on the cutting board. It's, mm -hmm. it's gorgeous. It's easy to work with. It's flavorful. Yep. It cooks more easily. It has, you know, it's just more vibrant overall and ultimately better meal yeah absolutely well that's great mary hey mary if for those of uh those watching who aren't familiar with uh growing chefs i know for you one of the challenges is volunteers it's you, you work with a huge network of volunteers and you rely on that tell everyone a bit how they could get involved if they're interested absolutely so normally in a in an average school year we run two classroom gardening gardening and cooking programs a year one in the fall and one in the spring and for every one of those classrooms and usually like i said we're working with upwards of 200 classrooms we need teams of three to four chef and community volunteers so the program started as primarily chef volunteers but it has grown and evolved to include volunteers from all over. So we have master gardeners, we have teachers, we have students, we have just passionate community members who love food. Um, and we are always looking for support. This year, we have been uh, providing our lessons online to help support families, teachers, and students who are learning in their home environments. So right now we're still utilizing our volunteer base to help provide digital lessons. We produce a new lesson uh, every Tuesday morning. It goes off at 10 a.m. Um, this week it's all about food systems. Um, but if you are interested in volunteering in a you know physical pet capacity in the future or to help out to help support our online programming, visit growingchefs.ca. And one thing I would really like to mention while we are having this live um, live program is that we've been running a new program for the last year called Lunch Lab, which is a collaboration with Fresh Roots, and it's a school lunch program. And since we since schools closed, we were able to very quickly pivot that program, and we've been relying on incredible volunteer support because at this point, Lunch Lab is offering is creating. 5, 000, upwards of 5,000 meals a week for families in need, feeding uh, over 260 families in the lower mainland of Vancouver area. And that's using the chef community, that's using farmers, that's using you know, fishers and food producers, volunteers who are helping distribute the meals. It's been absolutely beautiful. And you can also find out more about that at the, on the website. Actually, just last week, um, 
uh, the, there was a donation of a hundred pounds of spot prawns that went out to families. The chefs were able to make a beautiful chowder and provide each family with a small amount of, of fresh prawns. Oh, that's great. Phenomenal. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. So Mary, you, you started growing chefs. I think you were telling me beforehand about 15 years ago. Is that correct? I did. Yeah. Oh. I was a new young pastry chef, just super passionate about food and sustainability. And I saw all this knowledge in kitchens and, you know, how much knowledge chefs have, like we were discussing about how to safely use tools, also about local food systems, about agriculture, but how all that knowledge was trapped behind kitchen walls and chefs don't often have the opportunity to share that knowledge with many people. You know, they work behind the scenes, they work weird hours. So I wanted to help provide a way for chefs to get out into the community and share what they know with, with other people and help create more sustainable, more knowledgeable communities specifically revolving around food and food systems. And it started as just a fun little project with myself and a couple of chef friends. And before I knew it, more chefs heard about the program. They wanted to volunteer, more teachers heard about it. They wanted it in their classroom. And it just grew and grew to be this incredible program today that, like I said, it involves hundreds of volunteers, huge parts of the community. We end up educating thousands of kids. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Truly. No, no, it's an awesome story. I, I'm sure you can never have imagined how it's grown to this point, could you? Not at all. No. Not at all. I, it was, I mean, it wasn't started with a plan in mind. It was just a fun project meant for a couple friends. And I guess when you just kind of have something that hits the right moment, it works out. It just came along at exactly the right time and people really began to embrace the idea. And yeah. that was 15 years ago. Yeah. Just magical. Right. And you, at the top, you, you talked about how you had that passion 15 years ago. I would say you still have that passion. It, it shows in the way you speak about the program and, and what you're doing. And, and that's really important, I think, for, for, for kids in general, right? Do something you're passionate about, right? Absolutely. It really is. I mean, despite growing chefs becoming what it has today, I've never stopped working as a pastry chef. I you know, work full-time as a pastry chef and chocolatier because it is my passion. It's yeah. the thing I love getting up every morning to do. Yeah. And I love sharing it with other people. And um, it's so special. It's one of those special things because everybody can do it. I mean, yeah. of course you can do it on a professional level, but you can also do it in your home. You can do it for your friends and community. Um, you can do it with your family. And yeah. um, it's a very rewarding thing to experience. For sure. Food really brings people together when you think about it, right? It doesn't matter which culture you come from. Uh, you know, food is such a, a, a binding tool to, 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 you know, so much as it is a celebration for a lot of people of, of just gatherings. Absolutely. When you ask people about their favorite memories or their family memories, almost always they revolve around some kind of meal, yeah. sharing of food, growing of food. It's just, it's that, it's that connector. Yeah. yeah, you must do a lot of cooking in your family as well. I know you. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I usually like being involved. We, you know, we do bigger events like the Thanksgivings and the Christmas. I don't uh, cook on a day to day basis as much as I, I, I used to. And now I'm just busy working, it seems. And especially with the pandemic, uh, I'm like many others working from home. And <clears throat> it's almost like the clock never turns off because you can you can work from anywhere, anytime. Right. It, it's just uh, too convenient to work in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and one thing we've seen during this pandemic is so many people wanting to support restaurants and choosing to, especially with their busy lives, like you said, maybe they're homeschooling as well as working from their homes, is supporting local restaurants and supporting the local culinary community by mm -hmm. buying food to bring home or getting takeout. And that has been huge in allowing some of our restaurants to survive that wouldn't otherwise be able to. No, we're, we're certainly in challenging times uh, for, for so many industries, including the restaurant industry. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of positives that have come out of it, though, just seeing communities and people coming together. So uh, from that point standpoint, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see, you know, communities helping each other. Absolutely. And this seeming worldwide trend of people baking is really exciting for me to see. <laughs> just makes it a little bit tougher to find flour and yeast at the grocery yeah. store. Yeah. Okay. They're a hot commodity these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
But yeah. thanks so much for sharing all your great knowledge, Mary. Uh, you know, you've uh, you've certainly inspired uh, uh, thousands out there, as, as well as myself. And I I only hope for nothing but good things for the program and see it grow and expand further because it, it's something I think as a society and community we definitely need. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I have to, you know, this being an opportunity, I have to just put it out there that Growing Chefs does rely on the donations of individuals and businesses to run all of our programs. So if you're interested in donating or finding out more about how you can contribute, again, that's growingchefs.ca. Just got to get it in there. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Oh, before uh, we go, we should let everyone know tomorrow morning we're going to kick off a social media contest. So uh, look out for a post from us. We've got a great uh, House of Knives Grown Chefs prize pack that we're going to give away, uh, made up of a bunch of different uh, kitchen tools and gadgets. Uh, so if you've got aspiring uh, little chef at home, this will be the perfect prize pack that will help, uh, you know, hopefully inspire them to help a little bit more. Absolutely. I can't wait for that knife to come out. Yeah, I know we're excited, but we should have, it's kind of, I mean, it's hard to imagine because this one's uh, of course white, but the finished one is going to be a steel blade. It's going to have a red rubberized handle. So for extra grip and comfort. Uh, so it's going to look pretty cool. So yeah, once we get, actually, we're also adding uh, grant and edges to it. Uh, grant and edges are those little, some people call them dimples on a blade. So food oh, won't yeah. the blade either. And, you know, one thing we tried to differentiate by, it is going to be using a German quality steel, so it's not just, you know, I know that there's a lot of kids' knives out there, almost like toys, but this is going to be a serious knife that can can function in the kitchen for, for adults as well. Right on. Yeah. Uh, I'll send one up to you once, once uh, uh, and we can even engrave your name on it for you. Oh, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. I'm excited. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks again, Mary. It's uh, It's been a pleasure working with you, and I uh, look forward to uh, working with you guys further in the future as, you know, anything we can ever do to help out, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you so much. You guys have already been so generous, and we appreciate it. No, it's our pleasure. Thank have you. Great. Have a great night. Thanks for watching, everyone. Good night.